Welcome, I'm Dr. Jeff Borenstein. Everyone is touched by psychiatric conditions, either themselves or a loved one. Do not suffer in silence. With help, there is hope. Today on Healthy Minds. There really isn't a family in America that can say that no one in their family has suffered from a mental illness and or addiction. And unfortunately, for most Americans, we dismiss them as, oh, that's just being an adolescent. When in fact, what we're doing is really putting off an intervention that should happen right away. That's today on Healthy Minds. Healthy Minds is brought to you in part by the American Psychiatric Association Foundation, the Graham Beck Foundation, the New York State Psychiatric Association, and the New York State Office of Mental Health. Welcome to Healthy Minds. I'm Dr. Jeff Borenstein. Today I speak with Patrick Kennedy, a former member of Congress and a leading mental health advocate dedicated to changing the way people view and talk about mental illness and addiction. He shares his own experiences living with bipolar disorder and addiction and his journey toward recovery. We discuss his memoir, A Common Struggle, in which he traces not only his own struggles with mental illness, but those of his family, and reflects on our propensity to treat mental illnesses as family secrets. Patrick, thank you for joining us today. Thanks, Jeff. I want to speak to you about your book, a Common Struggle. How did you come up with that title? Well, the perception in the public is that uh, the question of a mental illness and, a, and or addiction is a question that occupies the interest of only a small group of uh, our society. And I think the big challenge we have as a country is to understand that, yes, uh, for those with se severe and persistent mental illness, uh, it's only a small percentage of our society. But in a real sense, uh, all of us should be concerned about them because uh, their struggle is really um, the most severe aspect of a more common struggle, which is that uh, all of us will at times in our lives face uh, mental illness and or addiction in one form or another. Either it's our own depression, anxiety, our own um, dependence on a chemical or an alcohol uh, prescription medication, or it's the uh, suffering of one of our family members. We're all affected by this. There really isn't a family in America that can say that no one in their family has suffered from a mental illness and or addiction. So the common struggle is not only that this affects all Americans, but what I wrote about in my book is that it's the silence that pervades this issue that's the uh, common struggle in all of this. So all of us could have a different kind of DSM diagnosis, but what unites all of us is the fact that the way we approach talking about this or not talking about this is more like it is really common. That these issues really invoke secrecy and shame. And, and that is the common struggle, is the secrecy and shame that uh, leads people not to actually do th something about these issues, to intervene, to help uh, their loved one get treatment, or the, for them to also seek treatment, uh, because the worry is that people will judge them. The struggle that results from the stigma, the prejudice, blocks people from getting the treatment that really can help people get better. So when I wrote the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act, which I co-sponsored with Jim Ramstead and my late father co-sponsored with Pete Domenici, was signed into law by President George W. Bush, um, it really did set up that our healthcare system needs to treat 
the brain illnesses that we speak about, mental illnesses and addiction, like any other set of illnesses of any other organ in the body. But what most people don't do is avail themselves of that treatment because of the stigma and because, frankly, insurance companies have not made good on uh, fulfilling the obligations of the law. And the reason they have not made good on following the law is that they're counting on people not availing themselves of treatment because of stigma, and they're counting on the shame that people feel around these issues, such that when they are denied care, which I believe they're denied care more often for a mental illness and addiction than they would be for diabetes, cardiovascular disease, or cancer, that no one's going to appeal that decision, and there won't be the outrage at that denial that there would be if it were a denial for cancer treatment. They know the person won't complain due to this stigma, due to the shame. And I think the insurance industry has calculated that into their cost and risk uh, benefit analysis, such that they are profiting off of people suffering, both their illness getting worse and the fact that they're not willing to demand what they're entitled to under the law, which is to get the same urgency of care that they would get if they had cancer or any other physical illness. You speak in your book about when you were young, when you were a young teenager, even before you were a teenager, feeling anxiety, depression. You had asthma, so you had medical care, but nobody asked you about that. And I'd like to have you share what your experiences were at that point when you had these symptoms and really were alone with them. Well, I describe in my book that having asthma ended up being a salvation for me because everything that was wrong with me could be kind of dismissed as part of my asthma. You know, when you can't see an illness, which is not only mental illness, but is things like asthma, I mean, you can physically measure it, you know it's real, the medical system knows it's real, but people don't know how to deal with it. And so what ends up happening is they dismiss it, just like they dismiss mental illness, they dismiss asthma. Oh, it's not real, I can't see that you're suffering. So asthma became a, a catch-all when I was moody and depressed and anxious, you know, and wasn't really, when I was reticent to be involved with things. Oh, that's, he's an asthmatic. That's the asthma acting yeah, up. He's an asthmatic. The uh, flip side of that is I got, if you will, medical attention for my depression, anxiety, and they wrote it off as he needed to rest because of his asthma. They couldn't say, you know, maybe he had a mood disorder or anxiety because that was judgmental. But it was less judgmental to say, I needed to go to the infirmary or I was, you know, needing extra rest you know, for my asthma. That was actually an excuse. And thankfully, I got that added attention because they assumed, well, he's an asthmatic. If I had only had depression, I think it would have been harder for me to have gotten and received some level of medical care, even if it weren't, wasn't appropriate to the the actual suffering that I had mentally, it was palliative in some sense because it was attention and it was kind of warmth and, you know, dignity that I received through people paying attention to this thing called my asthma. Which leads to an important message for anybody watching now that, especially for parents, if they have 
a young teenager, an older teenager who may seem anxious and depressed. They don't need to have asthma to get attention. They should be getting the help they need right away. That would be great. Let's That's try to work on for. that. We're yeah. aiming for that. Unfortunately, you didn't for that. And you describe in your book how, as a teenager, you started to self-medicate to help you get through the anxiety and the depression. I'd like you to speak a little bit about that. Well, I grew up in a family that had a real genetic predisposition for addiction and mental illness. Um, my mother suffered really debilitating alcoholism. Uh, my father had severe post-traumatic stress disorder and medicated around that. Um, I was affected in, in a very profound way by my parents' uh, mental illness. And I think that's true of most families that were affected by our parents. Not only the environment, but of course you add that genetic predisposition. You're almost in the vortex of a perfect storm for addiction. Now, I hope in the future that you'll do a family history in the doctor's office, and I'm not talking a psychiatrist's office, I'm talking about a pediatrician's office, a general practitioner's office, because mental health needs to be the occupation of every healthcare specialist, not just psychiatrists. Uh, and what I hope will be is the future is that you'll get a checkup from the neck up, and that we'll take a family history and say, oh, if we were to do a redo on my life, oh, Patrick, you know, you have alcoholism run in your family very strongly and addiction and severe depression and your grandmother on your mom's side, you know, died alone and after suffering really debilitating alcoholism like your mom and your father suffered terrible trauma, it's got to affect you too. We're going to make sure that we watch what you're prescribed We'll also make sure that we check on any illicit drugs that you use because we're worried that you have a high propensity to perhaps self-medicate around these, you know, genetic predispositions for addiction. I mean, imagine if we had a medical system that treated our mental health in the same way it would treat any other aspect of our healthcare, and that's do early screening and early intervention. I mean, imagine the possibilities in this country. So I tell my story so that we can also advance public policy because I was fortunate enough to play an active role in public policy, but our country still is stuck in this old mindset. These are issues you don't want to talk about because it was shameful for me as a teenager to act out in the way that I did. In fact, you know, my father said all I needed was a good swift kick in the ass. And while that may have been so in some respects, it totally negated the fact that I was self-medicating in a way that was very dangerous to my health. And it was by the grace of God that I made it through that and I didn't kill myself or someone else. These are not issues to dismiss. And unfortunately, for most Americans, we dismiss them as, oh, that's just being an adolescent. Oh, he's just a teenager. When in fact, what we're doing is really putting off an intervention that should happen right away. So in my book, I talk about my own personal struggles with addiction and depression, because these are common struggles. What I want to illustrate is that People should have known of all families. My family, my mother's alcoholism was well known. My father's post-traumatic stress was well known. The fact that my grandmother on my mom's side died alone and uh, just wasn't found for days because that's what happens when you have these illnesses. The fact that no one said, red flag, red flag, red flag, we're going to make sure that you don't end up going down that same road because it's like a high risk for cancer. Do you wait till it's stage four or do you say, oh my God, looks like you might have a predisposition to cancer. We're going to monitor that. I think that's a key point. And if we were Monday morning quarterbacks in your life, when you were younger, 
the pediatrician would have noted these concerns and helped you as a child and your family, as your parents, um, take steps to minimize the risk that your genetic predisposition may have had. What's shocking is that healthcare doesn't include, in fact, embed mental health as part of overall health. That we don't do a family history of mental illness addiction in the same way we would do a family history of stroke and cardiovascular disease, in the same way we would do a family history of cancer. Because if we know those things about you, what do we do? We do early screening, we do prediction and preemption of these illnesses in a way that we never do with mental illness and addiction. So here I had, my father had severe trauma seeing his brothers violently murdered. My mom uh, suffered debilitating alcoholism. Her mom died alone because of her debilitating alcoholism. This ran in my family. I had the genetic and environmental factors. We should have had that screened. And in the future, my hope is that it will be screened. I tell my story not out of some you know, sense of, you know, worried about how I was not given the best care. I was the beneficiary of the best mental health care. And even the best mental health care did not pick these things up because our current mental health care system still is oriented to a crisis response. You know, we only have mental health intervene when you're in crisis. The whole point of mental health reform is to intervene before it becomes a crisis. Let's do that for schizophrenia. What a concept. First incidents, wraparound services, lower medication levels for life, lower disability for life. Same is true with addiction. Don't let it become full-blown stage four addiction. Intervene at stage one, just like you would with cancer. That's the concept. When I wrote the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act, all I wanted is for mental health and addiction to be a medical civil rights cause, meaning that we would not have it as a separate and unequal system, that we would consider the brain an organ as worthy as every other organ in the body for medical attention and care, in the same way we would pay for care for any other organ in the body. That needs to be our guiding star, not dismissing people with mental illness and addiction as, as somehow flawed, you know, to be ridiculed, dismissed. These are real medical issues. No one gets up any given day and says, oh, I want to go alienate myself with everybody I love. I want to make them all angry with me. I want to go out and be ridiculed and made fun of. I want to be called names. Nobody no, wants to be Nobody depressed. wants nobody that. Nobody wants to be Who wants that? addicted. Who wants that? We need to dispel the public's image of someone suffering from addiction as somehow a choice. We need to dispel the public's perception of mental illness, that somehow people make these decisions as if it's a free choice. It's not. Our brains become hostage to the illnesses that they suffer from. And then we end up victims of society's prejudice because society doesn't understand the connection between brain and behavior. That behavior is a symptom of brain chemistry. These aren't character flaws, they're chemistry issues. It's not moral weakness, it's an illness. It's not morality, it's medical. One of the things that you speak about in your book is that you ultimately had the diagnosis of bipolar II. And I'd like you to explain to our audience what that means. Well, we need a lot more research into the brain, but we do understand today, better than we have in the past, that there are certain characteristics of various diagnoses that allow us to get better treatments based upon those characteristic qualities. Um, something called manic depression was the old terminology for what's now understood to be bipolar two, bipolar one, where it's more severe. All mental illnesses run along a spectrum, you know, like we hear with 
autism spectrum. There is depression spectrum. There's anxiety spectrum. The point is, is that we need to evaluate the severity of these illnesses because many people can have mild forms of depression, anxiety, so forth, and manage pretty well in their lives. But that doesn't mean they don't need some supports and the ability for us to manage those illnesses so they don't end up to become more severe. And for those for whom it's severe, that we manage so that they don't have to be totally debilitating. In my case, um, I had a kind of moderate uh, illness that was then exacerbated by my addiction. And that's another issue within the mental health community is that we bifurcate addiction from mental illness. And there are two systems of care, one for addiction, one for mental illness, when in fact we know that there are comorbidities, meaning people have mood disorders and they often have those co-occurring substance use disorders that accompany mood disorders. We often call it dual diagnosis. Dual diagnosis because people are self-medicating based upon their, their mood disorder. So we need a much more holistic approach to medicine to treat the whole person. It used to sound, oh, well, what do you mean? We know what we mean today. And what we need to do in medicine is to pay for the types of things that are going to treat not only the body, but the mind and the spirit. And that's not soft science anymore. We know via research that there are more optimal ways to treat people with these illnesses that are being paid for today. Politics are a part of your life and family's heritage. I'd like you to talk about the upcoming campaign. Well, first of all, in the fight for those struggling for mental illness and addiction, we've never had the kind of advocacy commensurate with the public health challenge of suicide, ranking twice the rate of homicide with overdoses, surpassing car accidents as the leading cause of death. We as a nation have a public health epidemic of mental illness and addiction, and we're getting nothing from our political leaders. We have the president talk about reducing supply. It's as if no one's advised him that these are chronic illnesses that need coordinated care. This has just got to be something we all work on if, if we value our country's future in this healthcare space, because it's all about healthcare. Mental health is healthcare. And yet, the 2016 campaign, the candidates do not have really thought through proposals. And really, that's on us as a community. We need to get our political advocacy up to speed. I mean, we really do. We have an opportunity to do that because health care reform is happening while we speak. And if the mental health and recovery community does not involve itself, decisions will be made that affect our lives for, for a long time to come. And it'll be on us that we weren't at the table. So I've uh, called on the nowcampaign.org, which was started by my Republican colleague and myself, uh, Representative Jim Ramstead. It's a bipartisan effort, the nowcampaign.org, where people can begin to have their voices heard and we can translate that into op-eds and uh, town hall meetings and political action. Um, where we can influence both Republican and Democratic uh, contenders for the White House and for the Senate and for the Congress. We're doing this in coordination with NAMI and Mental Health America and the advocacy groups. I mean, when you look at the rate of suicide in this country, twice the rate of homicide, and you look at the overdose rate, which is surpassing car accidents, it's shocking that we don't have a more articulate uh, mental health and addiction agenda in the 2016 campaign than we should have. And the whole hope with the nowcampaign.org is to bring that agenda uh, to this campaign. Patrick, 
I want to thank you so much for all that you do and for joining us today. Thanks so much, Jeff. Patrick's book, A Common Struggle, and his advocacy for mental health emphasizes the point that all of us at times in our life will face mental illness or addiction, either our own illness or the illness of a family member. The common struggle is silence, secrecy, and shame. His message is do not suffer in silence. With help, there is hope. Until next time, I'm Dr. Jeff Borenstein. Goodbye. With help, there is hope. Healthy Minds is brought to you in part by the American Psychiatric Association Foundation, the Graham Beck Foundation, the New York State Psychiatric Association, and the New York State Office of Mental Health.